debate on the global arms trade is a two-year research program funded in part by the Carnegie Corporation of New York. It aims to invigorate debate and policy about the arms trade through integrating the trade into other areas of policy, research, and activism. Additionally, this program seeks to catalyze discussions through the engagement of a younger generation. We are gonna provide you a bit of an appetizer of some of the research we have conducted in the first year of the program. We're not gonna get into a tremendous amount of depth because we want you to look at some of the new research we'll be producing in the next couple of months. We have a all-star panel with us today, and I don't just say that because they're on my team. They're uh, amazing, amazing researchers and activists. And so I'm really looking forward to focusing on our four pillars of our program. So everybody on the team that you see today is part of our associated researchers, and they will be focusing on militarization of the climate crisis led by Nico Edwards, rethinking how central the arms trade is in international relations with and among MENA countries led by Emma Sobrier, corruption in the arms trade led by Ruth Road, and defense industry influence on the government, specifically the UK led by Sam Perlow Freeman. If you have any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A function. We will definitely answer your questions at the end of the panel. So welcome to you all and thank you for being here again. We know there's a lot going on. So thank you for giving us your time and attention. First, we're gonna start with Nico. Nico is a second year full-time PhD student in international relations at the University of Sussex. Her research explores the drivers and implications of the ongoing environmental sustainability pivot in military industry and practice. She is also an advisor to scientists for global responsibility. So please feel free to share your PowerPoint, Nico. We are looking forward to hearing you, from you. It, it just be also, can we open the chat for everyone? Um, I don't think it will allow for participants to mm -hmm. chat in this particular panel, but you, they're more than welcome to submit anything through the Q&A. Questions, cool. Fantastic, can we see my screen? Yes. Perfect, and we can hear me. Yes, yes. perfectly. Yeah. Lovely, okay, thank you, B, and hi, hello to everyone. Um, I thought that per usual, I would introduce my themes uh, with a question that brought me here to begin with. Can war be environmentally sustainable? Because since coming across the idea of environmentally friendly weapons for the first time in 2020, this question has grown and played with me in myriad ways. Um, and I find it fascinating because it evokes all of those conundrums around war, uh, the realities of it and the systems that make war rational and des desirable despite its harms to people and planet mutating across generations. And the ecological impact of militarism and war fighting and the role of ecology in facilitating military practice are relationships that have gone largely unnoticed um, by policymakers and publics alike for a long time be it by silencing omission, ignorance, or disinterest. Yet in a time of globally intensifying military and ecological crisis, it's becoming increasingly difficult to overlook the reciprocity between these crises, causes, conditions, and solutions. And at least wherever I now turn, I feel like I encounter testimonies of a world in the simultaneous grips um, of global war and global warming. And as proof of this, voices from the communities to whom the military ecological nexus, as we call it, was always a visceral reality, are gaining ground, even among movements and in policymaking spaces where they were previously excluded. The 2020s is bearing witness to uh, military and security actors growing involvement with climate action and environmental sustainability, what I call green militarism, as well as, as, well as to myriad forms of resistance work there too. So across the globe, we can see how campaigners and communities are really rallying against this emerging myth that war can be made environmentally sustainable. And along these lines, um, I'll take you through some of the findings relating first to what green militarism looks like in practice, um, focusing especially on the pivot towards sustainability in the arms industry. And secondly, to what new contexts and alliances of resistance work that are taking form against this militarization of ecological action. And to policymakers, think tanks, and military staff across Europe and North America, whether war can be environmentally sustainable is not a rhetorical question. 
Since 2020, these regions have seen a frenzied release of military climate action plans, most notably coming out from the US, the UK, NATO, and the European Union. And this is a fast moving field, connecting parliamentary government, military, civil and industry, um, pub pub public and private actors, national and international. And the military sectors are waking up to the impacts of ecological crisis on military capabilities and national security, along with the military's own contribution to global warming seems timely. It is indeed necessary. Yet the narratives that underpin these sustainability agendas, positing military and climate action as compatible, stand in direct opposition to resistance actors highlighting of the negative ecological impact and injustices caused by military practice globally and an overemphasis in general on military or other forms of security. And something that is particularly worrying to resistance movements, and not only resistance movements, also far, le far less radical movements, is how the Green War agendas define and fix climate change as a security issue, as a threat multiplier or a so-called hyper threat with grave geostrategic and national security implications. And this corresponds with the climate and environmental security um, narratives that have dominated policy approaches um, to climate change and environmental degradation in recent decades. And these narratives effectively reduce uh, thinking and action around ecological crisis to concern with their security implications, right? And this framing makes it possible for defense departments and military institutions to position the military as a primary actor both, both in an inevitable war on climate change, which is what they actually call it, and in the impending climate wars. And this enables the promotion of military security doctrines and military industrial solutions as natural responses to the global conflicts that are assumed to just spread um, with worsening environmental conditions. And what's particularly striking about these agendas is how they take for granted that dystopian worst case scenario understanding of climate change and of societies and people's assumed inability to respond to, to environmental insecurities in nonviolent ways. And this normalizes the military's response as one based on adapting to and preparing for these scenarios rather than putting all our might uh, towards preventing them from becoming true. Even more striking, however, is how the agendas not only suggest military remedies to ecological emergencies, but also position the military sector itself as a front runner in the green transition. And to make this uh, green war narrative credible, defense ministries and armed forces rely heavily on a close collaboration with the military industry to drive research and production of green military technologies. These texts are meant to reduce the military's reliance on fossil fuel and decrease pollution from weaponry and warfighting. These greening initiatives include uh, powering fighter jets and Navy vessels with cooking oil, household waste and algae, increasing virtual war games and simulations to decrease real, real world training and developing low carbon directed energy weapons, biodegradable explosives, lead free bullets, solar powered drones and submarines, lithium ion battery tanks, toxin reduced rockets and solutions for turning waste explosives into compost. Some of these are quite ingenious. Uh, per usual. And this novel promotion of arms companies as drivers of climate care was made evident at the Defense and Security Equipment International this September in London, which is uh, Europe's biggest arms fair uh, ever. There you could find companies boasting with slogans like protecting people and planet, we defend people, we defend nature, creating products for a safer and more sustainable future, or defense net zero, or sustainability in action, as you can see here from BAE Systems. And next to these greening efforts, which are obviously minuscule in relation to arms production as a whole, still, there is an ongoing push by arms industries to be recognized as sustainable investment options, that is environmentally and socially responsible businesses. And this co-option of environmental sustainability by military actors is being justified through defining military security as inextricable from sustainability, arguing that the arms industry makes a de facto vital contribution to more sustainable world through helping to ensure security. And the naturalization of this link uh, in turn depends on a world 
um, to my mind, in which militarized forms are, of security are so normalized that we accept defense in ministry and arms industry discourses around both security and sustainability at face value. And unless we stop to ask what kind of security is really invoked here, we will fail to apprehend what kind of sustain sustainability that military actors can and are interested in guaranteeing, right? And ultimately, to my mind, military sectors wiring towards maintaining control, um, or as others have put it, securing an unjust global status quo and reacting to symptoms rather than addressing root causes behind conflict predisposes the sector's understanding of security and sustainability as one serving the interests of those with power and resources to the detriment of those without. Through promoting the idea of green weapons and naturalizing the link between arms production and sustainability. The sector is effectively mobilizing the whole, this whole myth and notion around war as greenable. And this narrative then makes it possible to present climate action and environmental care as compatible with arms production and military practice, justifying the arms trade as a form of climate action in and of itself. Most importantly, it also um, effectively obscure how the agendas make clear make explicit, in fact, that these military sectors would only work towards climate action as long as it helps to maintain or boost their military superiority. At present, the military is as promoting itself as going green without being widely challenged on the fact that it's doing so only so far as a greener practice allows uh, these nations to become even better at war, um, not at all to, to save the planet. What does this co-option process then mean for collective act and action towards ecological justice? What we're witnessing is the, is the creation of this powerful myth that the military sector is utilizing specifically to undermine ecological justice arguments that view the military and wider systems of organized violence, like policing and incarceration as well, as primary culprits behind the ecological crisis, or simply as enforcers of ecocide, right? And together, climate security policies and military sustainability agendas silence and rule out non-military responses that acknowledge um, that ecological crisis must be addressed holistically and multilaterally as non-military challenges. Green militarism, um, as I call it, <laughs> is thus particularly harmful to just transition movements who view disarmament, decriminalization, and demilitarization as necessary aspects of tackling the climate emergency. Though they need to be contextualized, um, e ecological justice frames come together in a shared understanding for how ecological crisis, their causes, embodiments, and solutions are systemic. This means that they are structurally bound up with other distributive injustices, uh, like social inequity, and intersecting forms of violence, oppression, and exploitation, as much against humans and non and more than human worlds. So addressing ecological crisis requires an intersectional form of both social critique and holistic thinking, the very antithesis to monodirectional military approaches that reduce uh, ecological emergencies to their security implications for the military, the market, and the nation state. How is green militarism being resisted then? There's fast growing momentum to drive new contexts of collective action to bringing together peace, justice, abolitionist and ecological movements. And 2022 and 2023 saw a veritable boom in initiatives bringing war, militarism, policing, climate change and wider ecological challenges together as joint causes. And in strengthening connections across these movements, there's great potential to enhance the capacity, creativity and reach um, of intersectional mobilization efforts that demand nothing, nothing short of systems change. And one such avenue uh, for resistance, excuse me, that has come out of my encounters with green militarism and its refusal is to drive and support initiatives that link together these four Ds, right? Demilitarization, decriminalization, decarbonization, and decolonization. It's a mouthful, but it's an important one. In other words, fostering thought, action and movement that recognize the inseparability of these concepts and processes as solutions to the linked harms caused by militarism, criminalization, extractivism, and colonialism. And the movements that I have encountered working on this nexus uh, map onto a, a useful typology of collective action that include various methodologies for um, approaches to and context of resistance work. Some are more elite driven, 
others are more grassroots based. Some promote direct forms of physical or economic disruption and others indirect mechanisms to disrupt the more abstract processes that also structure social relations like language and knowledge. Some target uh, virtual mass audiences uh, drawing on digital media commun communication. Others are entirely tactile and practical, such as working and caring for the land, sharing food, stories, and embraces. And of course, most initiatives are not reducible to policy-driven versus grassroots or indirect versus direct, but often involve aspects of all types. And notably, um, ultimately and notably, the nexus between mil uh, militarism and ecological injustice offers plenty of opportunities for innovation and expansion of this kind of collective action, specifically through bringing together these widespread, long-weathered um, social movements. So to conclude, um, I'd like to raise a point of tension um, that I keep battling in, with, in my role as researcher and so-called activist. What is the relationship between knowledge and change? between awareness and action, analysis and organizing. To what extent can my attempts to visibilize systems of harm as a researcher aid in the kinds of action needed to disrupt or, or ex at least expose those harms, right? And those systems. It's evident that without theories of change or theories of care that me and some colleagues in this webinar prefer calling them, um, that are up to the task of practically addressing the intersections of harm constituting today's poly crisis, awareness of how these harms are linked will only take us so far. Though these are monumental questions, I'd like to conclude with a powerful example of community building and resistance work from Puerto Rico that to me demonstrates just how to bridge that gap uh, between theorizing and practicing change. And Adjuntas in, in one, is one of the regions of Puerto Rico most exposed to generations of harms from colonial occupation, militarization, industrialization, and ecological injustices. And to counter these harms and co-create what they call uh, livable worlds, Casa Pueblo, that is called, built this movement organizing around the three Cs of science, culture, and community. And these pillars um, effectively link the need for producing and sharing knowledge for the conscious that is grounded in local culture and rooted in as well as geared towards building a thriving community. And I'll end here with a big thank you. Thank you so much for your interesting insights, Nico. They are truly terrifying. Um, I joke that I'm Nico's biggest fan because I think I've read at this point every single thing that she's published. Um, next, we are going to have Emma speak. Dr. Emma Sobrier is the director of the PRISM Initiative, an associate researcher with the Institute for Peace and Development at the University Côte d'Azur in Nice, France. Over the past 10 years, her research has focused on security strategies and foreign policies of the Gulf countries, as well as the political economy of the global arms trade. Her work promotes an approach to security in the Middle East that no longer focuses merely on political and military aspects, but includes a broader look at people-centered human security. Emma, you can feel free to share your PowerPoint presentation. Thank you so much. Um, yes, I'm gonna share my screen. It should appear very soon. see. Can you see all right? Yes, we can see. Great. Okay, well, uh, thank you so much for the introduction, B, and uh, thank you so much for your presentation, Nico. It was amazing to hear you on this, uh, on this research. Terrifying, but um, really fascinating. And uh, thank you everyone for, for being here. As, as B was mentioning, uh, we know that everyone has a a very busy schedule and we're very grateful that you're here with us. Uh, my name is Emma Souye and I'm uh, very excited to be here today to introduce um, what we have done this year uh, with the part of the revival, revitalizing debate on the global arms trade uh, that I'm in charge of, uh, the PRISM initiative and the SALAM uh, project uh, within it. So here on this first slide, you can see the beautiful website that we launched in uh, early 2023. 
um, and uh, I believe we will will be able to, to put the the link in the chat, of course. And so, without uh, further ado, I'll talk uh, more about Prism and uh, Salam. So let me see. Does it actually work? Yes. Uh, okay, so PRISM uh, for Pathways to Renewed and Inclusive Security in the Middle East um, aims to redefine the conception of security in the Middle East and North Africa as the starting point for strategic relations between uh, MENA countries and their European and North uh, American partners. Um, so it's the mission of PRISM to this, it does so in pursuit of effective collaborative ap approaches to ensuring a more peaceful and stable future. And so to this end, PRISM sponsors dialogue and debates between foreign policy professionals across diverse background and perspective, um, as, uh, as is stated in our mission statement. Um, a word on where it came from uh, is, I, I was part of the, the previous uh, project on defense industry, foreign policy and armed conflict with the World Peace Foundation, uh, also partly funded by the Carnegie Corporation of New York and uh, being in charge of the, the case study on, on French arms exports and how French uh, arms exports like many other arms export did not uh, stayed uh, unabated uh, despite the eruption or continuation of armed conflict, it, it really became uh, important to see how in many of the narratives of policymakers, uh, the, the importance of, uh, or, or so, um, the assumed importance of the of the arms trade in bilateral relations or so-called strategic partnerships uh, always came as a, as an argument for why uh, the the arms trade would not uh, would not be halted, uh, in, including in cases where one could expect them to be. Um, and so, uh, so that's that's where the the idea of really needing to redefine the conception of security in the MENA region and 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 really uh, redefine strategic relations between MENA countries and uh, well, France uh, partly, but a lot of uh, European uh, European countries and uh, and North America uh, came up. So. Uh, Prism is um, what I what I think the most important thing to to point out is is that uh, Prism is a multifaceted in initiative. It is an idea and a research project, and uh, and it will also be as I I will present a network of scholars, and uh, down the road a place for uh, critical security. Uh, scholars to meet uh, where where I'm based here in in Nice. So to talk a little bit more about the projects as they as they have um, already started, Salam is really that idea, the, the research project. Salam stands for Sustaining Alternative Links Beyond Arms and the Military, which is with the starting point that I just uh, mentioned. Uh, this project proposes to rethink the centrality of the arms trade in international relations with and amongst Middle East uh, and, and North Africa country, countries. And so it fosters to uh, an amplified idea from a network of scholar and practitioners uh, working in and with uh, the Middle East. Um, and I'll get more into presenting what, what the Salam project has, has looked like uh, until now. Um, the PRISM initiative also uh, includes the PRISM directory, uh, the aim of which is to connect academics of sustainable Middle East uh, security. And if you go on the website for the PRISM initiative, you'll see that uh, if you are yourself an academic of um, um, sustainable Middle East security, we'll, we'd love to hear from you. And if you want to be part of the network, that is something that is currently be uh, being put together. Um, in addition to Salam and the Prism directory, um, Prism has a future project 
most importantly, uh, the idea of having young uh, residencies bringing together the next generation of critical security visionaries uh, to have um, in-person uh, seminars, you know, week-long uh, get-together to brainstorm these ideas and make sure to establish as much connection between uh, between this network of, of scholars um, as possible. So uh, going into Salam now, um, so the, the organization of Salam, it primarily consists of a series of roundtable debates uh, from which uh, synthesis papers uh, are produced every, every single time. And in each round, um, eight authors present a short paper as a starting point for a discussion. Uh, while the debates are, all occur in, in private under Chatham House rule, each essay and the resulting synthesis paper um, is then published on the PRIF website. Um, before I go into the, the four debates that, uh, that are planned, two of which already occurred, uh, I wanted to mention that the we have three stellar expert associates um, that are present at each of the Salam workshop, uh, bringing their valuable input into the conversation. Pinar Bilgen um, and, and Jennifer Erickson, as well as uh, Coralie Pison Hendawi. And uh, the activities of Salam would also not be possible without the precious support of uh, Bridget Conley and uh, B. Anasena de Orpiz uh, Foundation. So the first debate uh, happened in, in April um, of this year. It was focused on the role of the uh, arms trade between Europe and North America and the MENA region. And on the right here, you can see the, the eight participants mm -hmm. to this first uh, debate, and I'll, I'll, come, I'll go more into this uh, in a minute. And then the second debate happened in September, uh, so last month, and uh, this one focused on the op opportunity costs of uh, the arms production and arms trade in and between North America and Europe in the MENA region. And uh, we are now uh, currently organizing the, the last two uh, debates for for now uh, that are that are planned that are on the books and so uh, the third debate will happen in January and it will be on the impacts of the militarization of foreign policy and specifically how um, the militarization of foreign policy um, the 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 reflex of militarism uh, as as was uh, mentioned before has um has a huge consequence on how countries go about some topics such as migration or terrorism. So that's the third debate that will happen in January. And then the last one in person uh, in July uh, will be an initiative to decenter arms in Middle East security. Um, the first uh, debate, um, so that was on what is the role of the arms trade between uh, Europe and North America and the, and the MENA region. Um, I didn't resist the, 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 the temptation of showing you the variety of, uh, of essays that, uh, that came out of this wonderful uh, first debate. And so you can see here all of the the memos that were published on the Prisma website. So the eight memos. Uh, so going really from uh, case studies on specifically US arms transfers, but also uh, European uh, European arms transfers with, uh, with the Franco-German perspective. Uh, other case studies were, were more focused on uh, one country in, in, the, in the Middle East, such as uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, with, with Shadi, Man Shadi Mansour's uh, paper. And we had a broader, or, or uh, Ezra, uh, Ezra Serene's paper on, on Libya. Um, and we had general discussions starting from this on you know, the, the role of the arms trade and uh, what are the narratives and, and really trying to debunk those uh, narratives. So the synthesis paper is also uh, available now on the on the website since uh, since July. 
and to give you a little a uh, little nuggets from uh, from this uh, this uh, synthesis paper the idea was to as as i just mentioned really put uh rem Remind remind everyone what are the conventional propositions or narratives about uh, this so called role of the of the arms trade, and so of course we had the economic value of it and the fact that uh, the arms trade is is bringing security and stability for the region, but also an important uh, aspect which is that arms trade to this day are is uh, believed to provide influence for the exporter uh, to, towards the, the, the client. So of course, uh, as you may guess, uh, then the, the discussion really questions uh, those question those, those conventional narratives and unpacks, uh, for instance, the idea that the arms trade successfully ensures security with, uh, as, as was already a little bit mentioned, this central idea of whose security are we talking about? Um, the 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 idea that of course the security of uh, the the authoritarian regimes and the security of the and the safety well being and security of the populations are two entirely different topics, um, and we also question the idea that the arms trade is an efficient tool uh, to exert foreign policy influence. If anything, actually, as was as appeared in, in these debates, uh, we tend to see a phenomenon of reverse influence today from client states uh, towards their, their supply, uh, supplying states. And we also unpack the idea that the arms trade supports better strategic uh, cooperation. In short, uh, the, the discussions led to really uh, underpinning the fact that the arms trade reflects and fuels transa transactional and militarized uh, diplomacy, a topic that we'll come back to with a, with a third uh, debate. And, um, and it was the opportunity to also see how much uh, global dynamics today, uh, evolution, especially with the, with the growing role of, uh, of China with a, with a different approach, is really uh, reshuffling the 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 rules of of the game as to how uh, traditional Western exporters are are seeing um, the the how much their narratives uh, perhaps hold even less true uh, in, in against the backdrop of the of the new uh, global dynamics, and then. Finally, we, we pondered what was uh, needed and uh, essentially the idea was that we, we do really need a, a franker assessment of the arms trade and more robust uh, policy alternatives. Um, in, the, in the second uh, debate where we focused more on the, the opportunity costs of uh, the, the, this uh, arms trade, um, the debate was really more divided into two questions. One was, uh, what was the policy opportunity cost of prioritizing arms manufacturing and trade? And the and the other aspect was about what are the economic opportunity costs of new trends uh, in the MENA region? Prioritizing investment in arms production and the arms switch, which is Really interesting because uh, even though, as as we had seen partly in in the first debates, a lot of the narratives that are still pushed forth uh, it to to support the importance of of continued arms trade as as a as a center pillar in in strategic partnerships, you actually see today more and more countries, including in the MENA region, uh, wanting to become. Uh, armed producer and, and arms exporters. And so we looked at the economic opportunity cost of, of such uh, strategic policy, policy choices. Um, here again, we had a number of different uh, case studies, uh, including um, the case of, of Turkey and, uh, and the case of the GCC countries, mostly with Saudi Arabia and the UAE. And uh, we have a the excellent uh, paper by Nico Edwards that is already out uh, on the on the website, specifically on the U.S. and German uh, eco-militarized relations with Israel, 
as well as uh, the the case study that I just mentioned on the GCC and uh, the Turkish uh, case study, and more uh, are to come, of course, because uh, you see there are only there are three um, up. Um, what this debate to to give you a, a little bit of, uh, of of meat so that you can uh, you can look at the website and and look for the the synthesis paper when it comes out in a couple of weeks uh we discussed really uh, the the evolving regional and global context that are really uh critical today in understanding the the dynamics so again we we looked at you know, this multipolarization of, of uh, international relations, but also mo more specifically, the uh, increased South-South uh, relations. And then uh, from there, we really delved into the, the, the economic and political motivations that underlie uh, the, the, the choice by more and more MENA countries to produce their own, uh, their own weapons. Um, and also increasingly export them uh, region to within the region, which we can see, for instance, as uh, Ibataha covered uh, between, with the increased arms trade between Israel and uh, and Arab countries. Although, of course, the current uh, situation might uh, put a halt uh, to to that. And then, uh, and then we delve more into economic opportunity cost and uh, political opportunity cost, um, as I just mentioned. I, I hope this uh, this brief presentation of, of what we cover in the Prism Initiative and the Salam uh, debates uh, will want you uh, want wanting for for more. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Emma, so much for all of your incredible work. Emma is always finding new ways to bring in innovative voices on the global arms trade. She does a lot of work to um, really try to find interesting people. So make sure to check, check out PRISM. Next, we're gonna hear from Ruth Rode. Ruth is a co-founder and program manager of the Corruption Tracker Project. She is also a research and project coordinator for Shadow World Investigations UK, where she primarily works on a project on the role of the arms trade in the Yemen war. Ruth holds an MA in International History and Politics from the Graduate Institute of International Development Studies in Geneva. She is also a dedicated member of the German peace movement, campaigning for nuclear disarmament against the arms trade and for a world founded on peace and solidarity nationally and internationally. What a bio, Ruth. Uh, please feel free to share your presentation whenever you're ready. Hi, everyone. Yes, let me just do that. Thank you so much um, to everybody for coming, just reiterating that. And thank you so much for um, Nico and Emma who've already spoken. And some of the themes um, that you have already mentioned, people will hopefully see picked up through, through this presentation. So um, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about uh, the Corruption Tracker Project and also what we're doing as part of this revitalizing the debate on the global arms trade project of the World Peace Foundation. And to do that, I'm going to talk you a little bit through what we at the Corruption Tracker are doing to help each other understand corruption in the arms trade. And to do that, it's really important to first understand why it's important to look at corruption in the arms trade. So first of all, and this will sound familiar to any of you who have worked on <laughs> the arms trade for a longer period of time is that the arms trade is one of the most corrupt business sectors globally um, and both is both the cause and an expression of politi political and moral corruption in high politics. So it is one of the reasons why countries buy certain weapons. It's some of the reason why countries buy weapons at all it is associated with a lot of opportunity cost, as well as all the usual conflict implications that go hand in hand with um, with buying weapons and the types of weapons you buy and the types of relationships you build, as Emma was already mentioning, in doing so and in building these sort of buyer-seller arms trade relationships that often are accompanied by massive corruption that can have severe negative impact on um 
on political systems domestically, but also on, on peace and security more broadly. So basically, the Corruption Tracker Project, we use corruption as a lens to criticize the arms trade. Um, and we also see corruption as one of the ways in which the arms trade causes harm before weapons are ever even, quote unquote, used. We all know that they are used just by existing, but um, used in, in war or conflict specifically. Um, so just a little bit of background on what corruption even is. So Transparency International has defined it as corruption being the abuse of entrusted power for private gain. Um, but really, we we practice a, a sort of deeper understanding of corruption, wherein as the uh, UN, UN Office for Drugs and Crime says here, corruption refers to the sort of decay that leads to destruction. So really, um, it's not just, we understand corruption not only as an individual bribe changing hands or even an individual arms deal being corrupt, but the in, an entire system that runs to the benefit of, of certain interests and certain few and is exploited in that way rather than uh, contributing or being set up to contribute to, to security. Um, so by now you might think, oh, okay, so <laughs> how does the corruption tracker, what is the corruption tracker actually and how does it contribute? To understanding our trade corruption. So the first thing is that the corruption tracker documents cases of corruption in the arms trade. We have an online database. I have put the link in the chat later, um, where we have currently 53 cases of case studies of corruption, uh, cases of corruption and solid allegations of corruption um, in the international arms trade. And you can search this for your country. You can search this for specific weapons or companies. Um, and we have found in conversation with various people that this is a really helpful tool for people to understand what their own countries is, are doing, to understand sometimes situations they find themselves in in their own countries as being part of a broader context um, of 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 these kinds of systems all over all over the world. So um, that is that is the first aspect of what we're doing. The second aspect of what we're doing is that we are trying to make this information as accessible as possible. So a lot of the research that we do isn't sort of the investigative type original research where we uncover corrupt arms deals that takes a long time and is very difficult to do. Um, instead, we rely on a lot on activists, on journalists, to on countries' judiciary system, core systems to do this kind of work and then we make this work accessible, not only by collecting as many of these cases as we can in one place, but also in sharing this information more broadly. Um, our most important tool for this is social media, trying to make, finding ever new ways. We're learning a lot um, and we're in a process of learning how to communicate more and more effectively about these uh, cases of corruption and the sort of connections between them. Um, yeah, and to do that also, we enter into discourse. We're not just an organization that tries to collect as much information as possible, but we also want to engage with people about that information and also want to engage with how it relates to other the work that other people are doing on similar issues or on other issues that are broadly related to a sort of a social justice agenda. And so um, we give all kinds of workshops and um, webinars and in person and in, and online. We do this for different kinds of audiences, like because we're a very youth-led team, a lot of our audiences are more like younger people or more like activists, but sometimes we also do sort of more higher level politics <laughs> type of things. Um, and, and in that way, we're trying to both share the things that we've discovered, um, but also learn through the engagement with um, with different people to understand different perspectives on on our work and how our work helps people develop their perspectives on their work. And that exactly brings me to the sort of point that is most relevant to this right and revitalizing debate um, aspect of our work in that we seek new perspectives. We, um, we have a blog where we publish sort of sporadically like analysis of certain things as much as we can. We also 
who um, host online discussions. And um, as part of as part of this World Peace Foundation project, we are, for example, soon hosting a, a workshop in the spirit of understanding better what what uh, what Emma was talking about regarding the strategic partnerships between transatlantic actors in the MENA region. Um, this workshop will focus specifically on the case of Egypt and the case, to some extent, also the case of the United States, but within a wider context of the region. Um, many of you will have heard that very recently in the United States, uh, the chair of the US Senate Committee on Foreign Relations was uh, indicted on corruption charges relating also to uh, relating to his engagement with uh, Egypt. And obviously, Egypt itself has a very um, difficult and pr problematic military setup of the state that makes it an extreme example, yes, but also a very potent example for showing a lot of the sort of issues and patterns um, around military and militarized relationships that function through the arms trade and different levels of corruption within that, both in terms of actual bribery as in the case of this U.S. senator, but also in terms of um, in terms of moral corruption when it comes to human rights and other things, and the impact that this has not only on our Western states' relationships with uh, with the Middle East, but also our impact on the civil society there. So, for example, in this particular bribery scandal that's also on the CT um, website, you can read up on it there or in the media. Um, <laughs> Um, we ha can have situations where this kind of bribery leads to very tangible impact on on negative impacts on the population on the ground. In this case, um, certain meat products prices increased uh, due to the way that the bribes were paid to this U.S. senator through a monopoly uh, on halal meat certification um, with a specific company. So we will discuss this and we will also discuss um, how we can build better, be, build better relationships um, of solidarity with the Egyptian people in an upcoming webinar um, that we will have soon. We will announce everything about it as soon as possible. But this is basically also our role is to communicate with a slightly more wider focus, a lot of the amazing research that is being done in the background here by, um, by, by things like the Salam Project, but also um, by people like Nico, on um, the environmental aspects and the relationship to the climate crisis. I put you here just a few slides from a webinar that we did in May about um, the climate crisis and militarization and how to build uh, movements around it. We had some amazing speakers. We had Raish Nur Mohammed from South Africa, um, Manal Shakir, Shakir from Palestine and um, Nico as well from as, as you saw her amazing presentation before. <laughs> um, the, the rec I won't spoil for you the entire contents of this discussion. They're very interesting and they're uploaded online. I will share the, 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 it in the chat with you. But I think this, this webinar was a perfect example of how we're trying to sort of bring movements together about it and ask really difficult questions about whether the military and social justice are able to coexist or, or not, to what extent to what extent cooperative, what cooperative uh, resistance can look like to militarism, um, as in the case of of, of Palestine, um, yeah, obviously a very very timely sort of um, topic, and then obviously as part of the project we have been publishing a a number of um, new sort of case research summaries of a variety of cases that you can all read up um, on, including this recent US example, but also cases on Uganda and on Qatar and on the UK and um, and other countries. And within this, it's always really important to us. We are a youth-led project. This is some members of our team. <laughs> and um, we are a very youth-led project and we want to also act that way. We are in a learning process about all of these issues, but we want to learn together with our audiences and we have the amazing opportunity to be able to um to work with some of the awesome people experts here on the panel and elsewhere and we're hoping to bring together some of this to yeah to carry that learning not just for ourselves but also for for our communities that we're we're building so um why can't i take slides now yeah 
So thank you. And please do follow us on social media to keep up to date with things like this upcoming workshop. And um, yeah, thank you so much. I may be a little bit biased, but what a powerful and very attractive young group of people. Uh, <laughs> the CT has really expanded over the last couple of years, and I'm really looking forward to um, seeing the next panel that we host on Egypt. Um, so last but not least, we will hear from Sam Perlow Freeman. Dr. Sam Perlow Freeman is a research coordinator at Campaign Against Arms Trade in the UK, where his research addresses UK arms export and the political influence of the arms industry on UK government policy. His other areas of expertise include data on world military expenditure, arms industry and trade, and corruption in the international arms trade. He has published widely on topics including the arms industry and trade, military spending, defense and peace, economics, and development economics and an academic policy and campaigning context. Sam is also our go-to for a lot of different topics. I'm sure many people on this call uh, can identify with that. Sam, feel free to share your PowerPoint whenever you're ready. Thank you very much, B, and thanks to all the preceding speakers. It's really uh, fascinating stuff. I mean, of course, I'm I'm familiar with a lot of what my co-panelists have been doing, but just to hear all of it and all put together, it's really amazing work that's going on. So um, my uh, current project is on the influence of the arms industry on government policy in the United and government in the United Kingdom, uh, the arms industry state relationship. Um, I'm working on two reports. One will focus specifically on the UK case, and one will be a comparative study with uh, other countries, US, um, France, Germany, Italy, Australia, among others, um, using both this research I'm doing and existing studies. So when we're talking about um, arms industry influence, uh, the, the starting point is traditionally um, uh, Eisenhower's famous, whoops, uh, I uh, went forward sooner than I intended to. Um, just a minute. So uh, Eisenhower's famous quote about the military industrial complex um, and I can hopefully reshare my screen again. Um, so this conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large in arms industry is new in the American experience. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought by the military industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. And I've uh, highlighted a couple of key terms there. One could more technically describe it as the development um, or, or the idea from Eisenhower's quote has developed of systems and structures of vested interest in the government, military and Congress or in, in the US that favor the arms industry is what we might mean by the military industrial complex. But what is unwarranted influ influence? So lots of people try to influence government in many ways, whether companies or interest groups, uh, uh, NGOs and so forth. Um, so when is it problematic? I'd say three of the cases where it is. One is where it's creating or exploiting private interests of decision makers. So the most blatant form of that is the corruption that um, Ruth has just been talking about, but also things like the, the, the revolving door between government and an industry, um, or, or what in the US is often called legalized corruption in the political system. Um, another is, privileged access. So when an industry or interest has 
such strong institutional connections or is able to spend so much on lobbying that it has an access and a voice within government and to the key decision makers that is simply not available to other interests and to the vast majority of the population. So that in many ways can undermine democracy. And structural, uh, so this is when over time systems and structures are built up, structures of ideas, structures of institutions and relationships between key players that inherently favor an in a particular interest. Um, so, so that's the sort of wholesale systemic form of privileged access, if you like. One might uh, it call the extreme case of this, it's often called regulatory or state capture, where an agency or ministry of government or even the whole state apparatus is captured by a particular private interest so as to act primarily in that interest. So that's what I guess we're talking about when we talk about arms industry influence as something that might be problematic. How does it work? Uh, some of the most important channels are political contributions, typically campaign contributions, lobbying, which may be spending on lobbying on hired lobbyists, or it may be in-house government relations officers, for example, or the CEOs, just regular meetings with government ministers or top uh, civil servants. And it can be formal or informal, you know, it can be, uh, this is a meeting where we're going to discuss this particular programme, or it can be, you know, a dinner or, or um, a sporting event or something like that. Then there's the revolving door, um, uh, senior people going between employment in government and the industry that that bit of government deals with. So in this case, um, uh, the defence ministry or the ministries that... Uh, determine export licenses and so forth, and the arms industry. So there can be three ways that the revolving door gives influence at least. One is inside information that the people going from government to private industry may bring with them. Secondly is the network of relationships, their, their Rolodex, as is said. And the third, uh, perhaps more insidious, is expectation of future employment. So if it's a really common pathway, which it is in this case, from uh, defence related uh, government work to the arms industry, um, then your top decision makers may well be consciously or unconsciously thinking about their future employment. Uh, the people that they're negotiating with are their likely future employment. And in some cases, in, in recent cases in the US, it's been very specific. Uh, generals have lobbied to keep a particular problematic program and then have gone to work for the company that is in charge of that program, as a recent Quincy Institute report uh, um, showed. <clears throat> Others can be when you have government industry forums and agencies, so things that are specifically set up to link government and, in this case, the arms industry. For example, UK Defence and Security Exports, which is a dedicated agency within the Department of Business and Trade, whose only purpose is to promote arms and security exports by private companies. Uh, far disproportionate to the size of these exports in UK trade. And then there's indirect influence, for example, through funding think tanks, through the media, through working with trade unions, you know, keeping jobs in the arms industry and so forth. So why is this a problem? What consequences can it have? One, inbuilt upward pressure on defense budgets. We see this in the US in particular, where Congress people uh, who receive large arms industry donations regularly add markups to the defence budget over and above what the DOD itself has requested. That doesn't really happen in the UK. 
bad procurement choices, ones that are really more in the interest of the industries, gold plated um, and le leading to excessive costs and delays and poor performance for which the companies are rarely held to account. They get very favorable contractual arrangements, sole source contracting, sort of sweetheart de deals, very solid and stable levels of profitability. And for CAT, of course, a potential big concern is that it might lead to looser export control policies, that export control laws and regulations will be interpreted in a way that is favourable to industry, which we would say they very much are. Tolerance of corruption. Um, there was a big example in the UK, the cancellation of a serious fraud office uh, investigation into BAE systems because it upset BAE in the Saudis. Um, and a sort of, again, more broad consequence may be that this very close relationship between government and the arms industry can ensure that the military censored concept of security that Emma's been talking about goes unchallenged. It's, uh, it create, it fosters groupthink among all the actors who are discussing this, who are all have an interest in the sort of militarized aspects of security. So this is what one might expect to be the consequences of excessive industry influence. And I would argue that this is all what in fact happens in the UK as in many other major arms producing countries. Here's uh, some, some links to recent, relatively recent studies in other countries. So I'll uh, share the slides so that you can see those later. Many of you will be familiar with that. So that's some of the channels but what I've been thinking about a lot in this project is how to frame this, how to frame this overall relationship between government and the arms industry in the UK. And the idea of influence seems a bit too distant to me. It's like you've got the government over here and you've got the industry here and they're trying to sort of get their tentacles inside and influence things for, as an outside actor. But they're not an outside actor. They're just so much closer to government than that in, in terms of the sort of constancy of their meetings with government, the deliberate, dedicated forums that bring them together and so forth. State capture is what Michelle Fahey calls it in Australia. And I think there's a good case for that. But at least at large parts of the defence ministry and uh decision making on arms exports is very much geared to the interests of the arms industry. But even that I'm not totally satisfied with, because there's a thing about causality. It's like the industry has come in from outside and captured the state. But in many ways, this is because the state has invited it in. The arms industry has always been seen as central and strategic not like other industries. So even though in the UK it's totally privatised, the government has actively sought this closer and closer relationship with industry, which has given the industry so much unwarranted and excessive influence. So what I've come to see it as is that the arms industry can, in some ways, certainly the big major arms producers in the UK can be seen as a privately owned extension of the state itself. They are part of the state. That doesn't mean identity of interests. The state is not homogenous. There's inter-service rivalry even with the, uh, within the MOD itself and so forth. But they should best be seen as part of the state. I'll go over briefly how these channels of influence work in the UK. Interesting thing, total contrast to the US, political contributions is not a factor. Very few, not large, whether you're talking about the companies themselves or rich individuals linked to the companies, hardly happens. Um, why is this? Well, for one thing in the UK, Parliament has a very limited role in defence matters. They defer to the executive. Um, and both major parties are very favourable to the arms industry, conservatives 
and labor. Um, so perhaps they don't need to. Um, and they perhaps want to appear, you know, impartial between the Conservatives and Labour to make sure that they don't sully their own pitch for when government changes. They do do some sort of soft influencing in Parliament, um, social events and receptions, this armed forces parliamentary scheme uh, they fund where um, MPs get to cosplay as soldiers for a few weeks and then they get a certificate and a big fancy dinner where they're seated next to arms industry top uh, ex executives, um, as well as military figures. And I'd say that it's kind of about creating a favourable climate of opinion, rather than directly influencing a decision, which most of these individual MPs don't have a significant role in anyway. Some of them, of course, may go on to become ministers in relevant areas. But it's making sure that the climate in Parliament is favourable to arms industry influence. Lobbying, they do spend on external lobbyists, but mostly it's in-house. They have constant meetings with government, especially BAE systems, sometimes to discuss particular programmes, but very often, B help me with digging this out, um, it's uh, CEOs, government relations, uh, officers, um, directors meeting with the top ministers, the chief of defence materiel and so forth, um, which is essentially lobbying meetings. The revolving door is more significant. Um, we actually have a tool for uh, tracking this uh, on CAD. I'll show you that in a minute. Um, one recent example was Mark Sedwill, who was the cabinet secretary, the top government civil servant, in other words, and the national security advisor. He went on to be executive, a non-executive director of BAE systems. So that's a pretty blatant one. And numerous uh, secretary of states for defense and heads of the armed forces have gone on to arms industry roles. Uh, I will switch my share to our fancy browser. Here it is, the Political Influence Browser. It shows both the revolving door and meetings between government and industry. Here's the timeline of meetings. You can search it, of course. And if we go to the revolvers, uh, we could get all the um, people who have moved between, uh, top people who've moved between government and industry. Uh, I think if we, yes, we drag the slider, we can see people going across one way and the other. And you again, you can search for individuals, companies, departments, and so forth. Um, so I, I uh, encourage you to explore that. Um, so uh, the revolving door is certainly significant. Uh, I looked at all the top military and civilian MOD personnel who left between 2010 and 2021 through government uh, available data on top personnel. I identified 111 leavers, um, of which 42 definitely went into the defence and security industry, um, uh, 47 to non-security, private or voluntary things, or they just retired. 11 to other government departments, and 11 I couldn't trace what happened to them, or it was mm, borderline. So of the definite identified cases, 42% were revolvers. That's quite a large proportion. And when you break it down, slightly half of the, over half of the senior military people were revolvers. The ones who mostly didn't go into the industry were the ones in head office and corporate services or the central top level budget. And this is often your generalists, your finance and HR people, not the people who are directly working on military stuff. So that's not surprising. Whereas the ones who work most closely with industry in defense equipment and support, the procurement agency and the defense infrastructure organization, which as it says on the label basically, they're the ones that work most closely with industry and a majority, a clear majority of them went into the defense and security industry. 
there's some signs that the revolving door is slowing down a bit. For example, there haven't there hasn't been a Secretary of State for Defence who's gone over since um, 2009, and there have been at least four sex states who have left Parliament completely since then. Um, in the UK, ministers always come from Parliament, unlike in the US. Um, uh, and so that they've left the House of Commons, uh, but they've not gone on to the uh, de um, defence industry. Um, it also goes the other way around. Loads of uh, secondments from industry, not just from the MOD, but also the Department of Business and Trade, which regulates arms exports. Uh, half of all the secondments to DBT are from the defence industry. Um, there's also all these forums that regularly meet to bring together government and industry, and in one case, academia. The industry funds key security think tanks, one of these more soft areas of influence. Um, so that that's other channels. Um, so what's the effect of this? MOD procurement is widely seen as broken. Uh, this repeatedly comes up when you look at House of Commons Defence Committee and Public Accounts Committee reports are often really scathing projects failing, delayed, uh, costing way too much, disastrous, having to be cancelled, um, but industry rarely held to account. It's interesting, these Defence Committee reports are scathing about the MOD. They rarely have a bad word to say about industry. So maybe that's some of that soft influence on uh, on the MPs that's, that's showing through there. And the outcomes are really good for industry. Um, sole source contracts. BAE gets over 90% of its uh, MOD revenue from non-competitive contracts. And you get several others who are well over 50% of uh, like Rolls-Royce, Kinetic, Babcock, or, or around 50%, Leonardo. Consistent, very consistent, stable, strong profits. So like even when Rolls-Royce's civilian sales uh, profits went tanked into negative in 2020 because of COVID, their military aerospace profits were just fine. And as I've said, rarely held to account for failures. The companies are basically too big to fail. <clears throat> so coming back to this idea of extent, arms industry as extension of the state, we see this in government policy documents over the years. Two major industrial strategy documents in 2005 and 2021 called for each for less competition and more long-term partnership with specific companies. Um, in the 2021 report, the word partner or partnership appeared 142 times and the word customer 22 times. And none of those referred to um, the MOD negotiating with industry as its customer, um, or, or maybe a, a handful. Um, and the Defence Command paper refresh in 2023, post-Ukraine, was even more explicit, calling for a new alliance between defence and industry. So I thought I was being really edgy in suggesting that the industry is an extension of the state. And then the government policy paper comes out and more or less says it directly. So there's my whole thesis gone. Uh, but uh, and generally over time, the institutional embedding has got uh, even deeper. So just a thought here, coming back to that example of Mark Sedwill, the, the National Security Advisor and head of the Cabinet Office going to BAE as a non-exec director. What's happening there? Is that BAE recruiting a top person to get more influence? Do they need his information? No, they have all the information. Do they need his contacts? They have the Minister of Defence, the Chief of Procurement, the Chief of, uh, Civil Servant of the MOD on speed dial already. I think it's more, uh, a, in some ways, a symptom, but also reinforcing this deeply entwined relationship. It is a totally natural and normal move 
for someone to go from one part of the national security establishment to another, even if the other one is privately owned and primarily responsible to its shareholders. Um, so uh, that's the sort of understanding of this relationship that I'm coming to, uh, that, that will my report will be based around. Um, sorry, I'll go on, on for so long. And as you can see, it, it's actually very different than the United States uh, or um, many of the other countries that people have looked at, uh, a very British form of political influence. Thank you. Thank you, Sam, for these really important insights. Again, what a fantastic panel. We are running close on time, so we have about 10 minutes to answer any questions people have. If they want to put that in the Q&A feature, that would be great. And please make sure to state whether your question is for an individual person on the panel or for the panel um, as a whole. So we do have two questions already, but I'm going to blend them together, so maybe you can answer one or the other. Uh, the questions are... Um, for whoever would like to re reply, how have they seen debates about the arms trade change over time, or do you see any differences among younger generations and the current concerns they bring to the table? And feel free to start if you have a thought. I, I can start with a quick point, obviously, that speaks to both questions. It, it's it's evident that the greening within arms tech is happening as we speak, right? Like it's new for the industry itself, and and there's there's a lot of infighting. There's a lot of it's there are there are a lot of tensions still within the sector and the industry itself. Whether or not, to what extent to push for that, and to what extent that is jeopardizing deployments, etc. So that's really something changing us as we speak and it's interesting to see those those tensions coming out of it and it is something that you're picking up also from young people's interest in the trade or its harmful effect right because that's something that young people are more um, attuned to at the moment that makes a lot of sense Nico does anybody else want to add to this point I think, yes, uh, jumping in uh, on this, I, I would say, I mean, it has been the case in, in France, and I believe to a certain extent also in the US and the UK, uh, the fact that um, a lot of the major arms importers for a while were not really using them uh, or not, uh, at least not using them in, you know, active armed conflict and possible war crimes. Uh, so that uh, really changed a lot of things. I would say that there there really was a shift uh, in the in the number of armed conflicts that involved some of the 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 world's biggest arms clients. You know, uh, with the with the Arab Spring, and uh, I think that really prompted uh, more scrutiny on these topics. Even though it's it's. Uh, you know, sometimes, uh, sometimes happening slowly and sometimes happening more quickly, depending on what country you're you're looking uh, looking at. Um, certainly, in France, the debate has been slower than in the UK or in the US, for instance. Um, so that that would be my my first point. And what I think is interesting is to see today the kind of the, the 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 meeting dynamics of more scrutiny in some of the traditional western uh, exporters that has that has led to at least more firm uh, speeches about it if not <laughs> actual policies of halting arms sales and to see how much uh, these biggest clients have uh, taken note of that and and started shifting their own strategy. So that's that's the first one that I that I had. And when it comes to younger generation looking at friends, I would say that uh, perhaps sadly, uh, even though it's it's not across the board like that, but um, what I find really interesting is that is the clear opposition between. Uh, you know, 100% uh, proponent of the arms trade for, you know, always for, because because it always 
secures, you know, it, it always uh, ensures security and stability or whatnot. And the economic value, you always find the same arguments with, with job creation, whatnot. It doesn't matter how many times those arguments are debunked. It still it still comes up. So you have this this uh, community of people who really will hardcore support arms trade, and we've seen that uh, especially with with the new context of you know the 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 Russian invasion of Ukraine. You have in Europe just you know those the 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 people being really vocal about this have have just gone through the roof. And then on the other hand, you have also a young generation that is even more vividly opposed to arms trade. But the problem is that uh, those two communities tend to not communicate at all with one another. So that, that would be my, my second, my second point. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, Sam, I you- can, I can speak more for the older generations. Uh, and in the time I've been uh, working or campaigning on arms trade issues an awful lot has changed. There's been some very specific focuses on areas uh, and sometimes treaties on areas like small arms and light weapons, land mines, cluster munitions. There's been a lot of growth of NGO interest, which led ultimately to the arms trade treaty. Um, uh, so, uh, you, so a lot more acknowledgement that this is an important issue. There's been also the European um, common position on arms exports, but one which has been dealt with in a way that maintains the ability of the industry to export to its major customers, um, despite. So it's it's not just a cosmetic change. There have been real uh, gains as a result of the arms trade treaty but in, in many ways, it's been the, the process of um, conventional arms trade control has been managed in a way not to obstruct the major commanding heights, if you like, of the arms trade. I think there is more scrutiny. I'd say also in recent years, certainly the British government's been becoming less apologetic it's less about we must make these exports because jobs and um, more about this is the industry that defends us, that gives us security. So we export because this is enhancing our security. Um, I think I, I think I'm getting that vibe more and especially since Ukraine, um, of course. But but even even before that, um, the, 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 the idea of the arms industry as and indeed arms exports as being the guarantor of our security, giving us this strong industry has, has been more prominent in the defense of, of it. Ruth, did you want to add anything? I mean, I can only echo what, what the other three have been saying. I mean, um, I mean, what, especially the last point Sam made about the sort of less um or more explicit sort of perspectives of like security and those kinds of things i think uh, coming from a german perspective in particular i mean germany has done a complete 180 on not actually on export policy we have actually under the current government seen a few improvements um on export policy when it comes to what they call third part third third countries <laughs> um which to them is basically non-EU and non-NATO countries and a few other exceptions. Um, But generally, I mean, Germany is an extreme case of this, I think, because previously the language around military and militarization was very different and it's completely changed. There's recently been like reports of like specific parts of the industry being very relieved that for once they're not seen as the bad guys in society which they really were for a a number of decades and that's very different I think from other contexts such as the US and the UK where the arms industry has always had a base level of legitimacy that it hasn't had um, in in Germany and that it's now gained because of Ukraine. I think 
one interesting thing that I've seen working with a lot of the the groups that are even on this panel is that there seems to be more and more young people actually joining our movement and the arms trade. And I think the more interesting sort of aspect of the younger generation is the intersectionality work that they're doing, right? So like not only the work that Nico is doing, but I think about the work that Bridget Conley and I are doing in the United States, looking at how prison abolitionists sort of would respond to something like the arms trade. And I think that the more work that we do on building these important intersections around militarism, um, the better. So I hope that that trend continues upward in an upward trajectory. So we are running out of time. I just wanted to thank Nico, Emma, Ruth, and Sam for their memorable presentations. And we want to thank you for taking the time out of your day to learn about the work that we're doing at the World Peace Foundation. I hope that you all have a good day and let me end on a final note, which is free Palestine. Um, all right, everyone. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye.